I really hope you're enjoying this about half as much as I am, because I'm having a ball. Wonderful to have everybody come out and uh, be together. I had a wonderful time with your elders, most of them today. And uh, now, wait a minute, that came out wrong, didn't it? <laughs> and the funny thing is, I don't really know what I said. <laughs> But it came out wrong. Let's see. I met with some of your elders' wives. No, that didn't, that's not right either. <laughs> One of your elders' wives said this, said that. Anyway, we had lunch, and there were elders and a preacher and a couple there, and it was a great time. And, uh, and uh, later on, uh, thank God for that, I've been real busy in Africa not doing my major project. I'm going to tell you this, that probably Wednesday night uh, I will. Uh, I brought about... 50 brochures of my Bibles for Africa campaign, and that's the most exciting, most effective ministry I've been a part of in my entire life. And I get to tell you just a few minutes about it, and there's some brochures available, and if you want to help with it, it's the thing of getting Bibles into all, the whole continent of Africa, the whole country, 775 million people, and I have never seen such receptivity to the Word of God in my life as I have since I started that. It's the first time ever I've seen uh, men and women uh, cry and beg for a copy of the Word of God uh, after we had run out. Uh, I, I will tell you this quick story here tonight. Uh, we only had Bibles for the 11th and 12th grade. And when we show up at schools, they just the African kids all over are just, just marvelous. You're, all, you're out in little bunches of fives and sixes and having a wonderful time. And I was around five uh, g- girls that were sitting on a bench and... Uh, the principal called and said, come on, it's time now. And I went in, did my presentation, and gave all of them Bibles. And it's so emotional, and, and they're so happy, and they're so excited about it. And you're just emotionally drained when that's over. And I walked back to the bus, and then I realized when I got back to the, uh, to the bus uh, that these girls I was talking to were in the 10th grade. And we did not give them Bibles. And they were so excited, they came over to me and said, please, and crying, all of them, please, Give us a Bible, please. And I said, you don't understand. Uh, I, I don't have any more. And they said, we see them in your truck. And I had to say, man, I'm sorry, but those Bibles are for the other school. And I had to explain that, you know, I wish I could go back to America and raise all the money and then bring everybody a Bible. But we, it was so important that we'd bring what we got and we're going to keep coming back. And, and I turned them down. And boy, my heart was hurting like mad. And we got in the, i got to call it what it is, a bucky. It's a pickup truck. And they call them a bucky, and I keep stumbling over a bus and stuff. So I got back in the bucky, and, and we drove a little while in silence. And my grandson said to me, he said, uh, Papa, i got to tell you something. i got to confess something. I said, what? He said, those girls that asked you for a Bible, they also came to me hugging and crying on me. Please. He said, Papa, I stole Bibles and gave them to them. <laughs> so I want you all to pray for him that the Lord... That the Lord may uh, forgive him. We're talking tonight about praise your kids into greatness. And I saw your wildlife sitting here on the second row here of this congregation. And I asked them, <laughs> what, uh, what, what should I tell your parents tonight? And I gave me a list. Quit nagging. Increase our allowance. Give us a lot more freedom. Curfew three in the morning. A few things like that. But other than that, they were pretty happy with their situations in life. Not really. Would you listen to Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 1 to 4? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. There was an elder in Dallas, Texas, by the name of Bob McClendon, who gave me, when my daughter <clears throat> was about <clears throat> 15, 16 years old, the best advice as a father I was ever given. He said, Marvin, I always date my daughter on her birthday. And I thought, oh, man, that's a great idea. You know, a big ugly comes after him to take him out, you know, different place. You don't interfere with that, but you just first. I'm a father and I'm first. So I told Tammy the next birthday, October the 3rd, I'm going to take you out and, you know, and I'm going to dress up in my best suit and you wear your best dress. I'm going to get you a corsage and me a boutonniere and we're going to the best steak place in town. And it's just a wonderful thing. And we started doing that every year. I'm going to highly recommend that. 
And all of the teens said, Amen, you know. So uh, we go out to eat, and we're sitting there ordering. And there comes that marvelous time after you've ordered your meal that they uh, have all this time to fix it. And that's a wonderful time just to say, Tammy, uh, man, I've got to tell you, my, your mom and I are so proud of you. And we're so glad that God gave you to us, and you're just the neatest thing in the world, and I am so proud of you. Well, the food comes, and you really enjoy the meal. And a couple of times we also uh, went shopping, and, uh, and I can tell you some long stories on that one that, that are a lot of fun, but they won't add anything to the lesson tonight, so I won't. But anyway, you know, spending money on these kids, and I'd tell the sales girl my limit. And always it was about fifty, a hundred dollars more than my limit. And you'd have to say, "Well, that's just fine," you know, as you think about filing for bankruptcy. But anyway, you you go ahead and do it. But we were passing by the B. Dalton bookstore, and the little paperback "Love" uh, was displayed by Leo Buscaglia, who's one of my favorite writers, and I've read most everything that he wrote. And I said, "Oh, Tammy, there's the next book. I'm on. Buy me." And we walked and talked and held hands and had a wonderful time. And people look at this big old guy and this young girl. They know something's up. And they realize that this is special. This is just really special. And everybody's looking. And as they look curious, and then they realize this, this, is, this has got to be something special. And it was special. And uh, we got back home. And at my next uh, Father's Day, uh, I got that book. And I didn't bring it tonight. I was really looking for it in my shelves. Uh, I just got home from Africa, like I said. And I wish I could have read you a book that is not for sale. And I really wish somebody would try me, because I really believe with all of my heart some things have no price. And I am solidly certain that $1,000 would not buy that paperback book that I've got out of my library. Those are golden moments. And those are things you do as you build bridges, not dig chasms between you and your kids. And we're talking tonight about praising your kids into greatness. Now, you can't drive your kids anywhere. Do you realize that? And parents, you know, in spite of knowing that, we keep trying. And we say to our kids, you're going to be the death of me yet. And they love to cooperate. So, you know, you can't. And you try to do all of these kind of things. But you can praise them into greatness. And this is biblically solid. And I want you to know that. That praise is a biblically right and powerful motivation to greatness and excellency. And Jesus started all off. Uh, we need to reread what Jesus did, because in Matthew 8, in verse 10, a centurion came to Jesus and said, Jesus, my servant is sick, and would you come heal him? And Jesus says, yeah, I'll come heal him. And, and the servant says back to Jesus, no, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. I'm a man of authority. I understand authority. You just speak the word, and my servant's going to be okay. And Jesus turned and said publicly, there's so many people in the church that say, now, don't call my name. Don't praise me publicly. They are lying. I'm going to tell you that right now. We all need it, and you may say it, and you may believe it, and you may argue with me later, but you've got a right to be wrong, and I'm going to back that right. But we all love to be praised. And, and Jesus uh, turned to the crowd and said to the crowd, I have not found so great faith, not in all of Israel. And so Jesus set the precedent for praising and we could let our fingers walk through the yellow pages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and find other places where Jesus did this. One of my favorites, now that I've got my Timothy, my grandson, Kent, following in my footsteps and filling in in Africa and staying there, even this time after I left, the book of Philippians is one of my favorite books. And, and, and Paul found Timothy, uh, this young son. He called him his son. Paul wasn't married, didn't have any children, but he, but he knew this relationship. So the last book he wrote, probably before he was killed, was to was Second Timothy to my beloved son. I have only one request before I die: Could I look upon your face once more? And Paul writes to the church in Philippi and says in Philippians two at verse twenty, "I have nobody. I am sending Timothy to you. I have nobody like him." I mean, God knew the power of motivation. My grandson that's over in Africa now said to me one time, he said, Papa, there's a lot of difference in the words, I love you and I'm proud of you. Well, yeah, there is. And I said, well, tell, tell me what you're thinking. And he said, you know, you know Papa, my, my dad always says I love you. And, and he shows it, and I know he does, but he never uses the words, I'm proud of you. And I don't know whether you parents realize this or not, but the kids need 
I'm proud of you, maybe more than they need your words. I love you. Hey, they do wrong. Go to jail or killed. You're going to say, I love you. I love you. As you go to the gas chamber, they're going to go in there loving them. But they're not proud of you. They need so often, and they have so many places where you can, say to them, I am really proud of you. A few weeks passed, and Kent said to me, Papa, you talked to my dad, didn't you? And I said, well, why do you think that? And he said, because he says I'm proud of you an awful lot more now. Now, I can't give you the initials right out now, but they, they now sign all of their emails and letters, uh, Father in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, Son in Cape Town, South Africa, with I-L-Y-I-A-P-O-Y, like that. And they all know that I love you and I'm proud of you. It's a marvelous, wonderful motivation. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17, the elders that direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor. And the first one of these sermons I preached like this was called, You Can Praise Your Church Into Greatness. You Can Praise Your Elders Into Greatness. And we started a campaign about that time that I highly recommend for your preachers, for your preacher's wives, for your staff, for your elders, for your Bible school teachers, and anybody else you want to lift up. Have a time of praising them and get them up before the church and tell the people how proud you are of them. The Bible says they're worthy of double honor. Now I want to show you how God feels about you and praise uh, there's so many people in the world that have a lo low self-esteem. Let me tell you what the cross says. The cross of Christ speaks two things loud and clear. Just the fact of the cross of Christ. Your sins are really, really bad. If anybody comes along and says, I, I just haven't done anything too bad, you need to realize that your sins cost the death of our Lord on the cross. They are that bad. But I'll tell you something else. The cross says how valuable you are to Jesus. There's a couple of verses that uh, I like to put together. One is Hebrews 4.13 where it says, All things are naked and open under the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. That'll scare you. In fact, my mother used to scare me with that all the time as I was growing up. She'd say, God sees you. You go off in the dark, God sees you. You go in the next town, God sees you. You crawl in the back seat of a car with some girl, God sees you. Scared me to death. You know, and then on top of that, the church thing. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. Well, later on, a 92-year-old man that gave me the, uh, the trust in my business I was telling the elders a little bit about and, and helping me to go to, to uh, Africa and Australia, but, but he, he gave me an idea for a sermon. He called it The Eye in the Sky. And it was from Hebrews 4.13. The eye in the sky. All things are naked and open under this eye. And the eye really is there. But the big question is, what kind of eye is it? Well, it's an all-seeing eye, but it's a, it's a loving eye. It is a grace filled eye. It is a compassionate eye. You know, and all those things, you see. So, so what God sees in the cross, it says loud and clear, you are worth dying for. I don't know how many prayers you've heard in church, several thousand probably, depending on the number of years you've been in the Lord. But I remember one Sunday morning at Garnett in Tulsa, I called on Jim Caldwell. See, I can't, I can't recall any of the other prayers, I think, through the years. But this Sunday we said, Jim, would you lead the opening prayer? And Jim gets up there like he always did. He'd crawl the pulpit and get up there and he'd say, shall we pray? And then, you know, you thought he'd had a heart attack or something. He stayed there a long time. And you're thinking, I'm going to risk one eye, you know. So you look up to see if he's fallen out. And after a while, he's, he was just giving you time to get just... Uh, you know, settle down. And then he said the first uh, words in his prayer were, God, it is an awesome thing to be died for. And that's who I'm looking at in this audience. And you may feel because of what you have done today or what you've been through or the circumstances of your life, man, I am really down. And I'm a nobody. And because of what I've done, I'm nothing. And God, who knows it all, and at, to his eye, nobody's ever deceived him. He's seen everything you've done. He's heard every word. He knows every motive of your life. And he thinks you're worth dying for. So it's very important for us to praise each other. And especially as we're talking tonight, that we praise our kids. And we cannot drive them anywhere, but we can praise them to greatness. Does the, does the name Charles Dumas mean anything to anybody in this audience? Would you raise your hand? It may not be the one I'm thinking about, huh? But Charles Dumas was the first man to high jump seven feet. Is that the one you were thinking about? Not the one. First guy to high jump seven feet. Now they, everybody does. You know, the kids go to kindergarten, you've got to jump seven feet to get, you know, something like that. 
But Charlie Dumas broke that barrier that it's kind of like the four-minute mile. It just was there forever. And doctors were saying about the four-minute mile, it is medically proven that if anybody ran that fast and that far, his heart would literally burst within him until, you know, Roger Bannister and John Landy and then everybody else breaks the four-minute mile. But Charles Dumas, in the day he broke seven feet, the people are there with radio and television. Charles, how did you break the seven-foot high jump? He said, my mom was the greatest motivation factor in this morning. She said, Charlie, go jump seven feet. He said, I was just doing what mama said. But all he really meant was that that woman had been the greatest motivating force in his life. Now, if I ask you if you know Richard Rogers, many more of you would know that grand old saint in the Lord that is now with the Lord. But, uh, and I know Rhonda really well, and I'm honored with the fact that Richard and I were very close. And his daughter said to me one time, and I really appreciate this, she said, Marvin, I miss my dad. Every time I had a Bible question, every time I had something just real heavy, I could always go to my dad. And she said to me, would you be my dad for me? And uh, she's not used that very much, but I really, I was really honored with that. But, but she said, and Richard told me this first, he said, when, when Rhonda would go out on a date at night, you know how your parents worry about that? They're going, that big, ugly fellow, like I said to the guy that came after my daughter, I said, hey, boy, you, you drink marijuana? <clears throat> He said, I don't even smoke whiskey. I mean, he was ahead of me, you know. They're coming to get your daughter. Richard would say the last thing as they walked out the door, don't forget whose daughter you are. And Rhonda said that that called for a lot of interesting conversations in the car. After, what did your daddy mean by that? And she said, he was just reminding me that I'm a child of God. And it probably saved them from a lot of problems and gave parents a lot of, a lot of comfort also. Hey, have any of you ever seen the movie Eight Cow Woman? <laughs> we ought to pass that one around again. It was a training film I saw when I was in the United States Air Force. But on this island where you bought your wives for a chicken or a goat, you know, if she's really good, you know, throw in a cow, heifer or two, you know. And on this island there was a woman that was born ugly and then somebody whipped her in the head with something else. And she got past the age of Marion. They called her a spinster. That's one of the nicest things they called her. And a guy came by to this woman who's the only woman in the village not married, and all of the young ones and pretty ones and pretty figures, and they all gone. And this guy came along and said to her, Father, I want her to be my wife. And the dad did a double take looking back at this girl that everybody had passed by. Nobody wanted. And he said, more than that, I want to give you eight cows for that woman. Nobody in that village had ever given eight cows for any woman. And in the training film, it had the, the ideas presented to you. How do you think that woman felt? And what do you think the other villagers said when they saw her walking through the village? They didn't say, there goes fat and ugly. They said, there goes the... I forget what it is. You have to fill it in for me. The eight cow woman. That's what it was. How do you think she treated that man? Like an eight-cow woman, you know. How do you think he treated her? And the marriage was so great. And see, the key to this thing was praise your woman, praise your church, praise your young people. And tonight we're talking about kids, and it is so difficult. I, I, I talk little about raising kids today because it's been too long ago since I raised them. But I still love them, and I love working with them. And I see the potential in all these kids that the world is just beaten down into a pulp. There was a guy named Jerry Cook. I think he preached in a Presbyterian church. All I know about him is that. And they wrote a, wrote a book called Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness. And the reason he wrote the book was his church wasn't doing well. I mean, it had its heyday, and now it was losing members and losing excitement, and it was boring, and people were hanging on with the big building and the empty pews. And it was a foregone conclusion. This church is going to be dead in a little while. And Jerry C. Cook asked himself the question, what do people have to do to me to make me give everything I've got for them? And he came to a conclusion, if you will just love me, if you will just accept me for who I am, if you will forgive my mistakes, knowing that in all of these, I'm doing my best. I would work my fingers to the bone for you. And realizing that in himself, he sold the concept to his church. It's a true story in a book probably worth reading. All I know about that book is its title and its author. 
but I know the situation works. And, and, and in the true story, the church began to grow and flourish in, in numbers and adding on things and doing great works. And everybody's happy. And he's a well-known uh, preacher all over the world. And it's all on the give ourselves love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And what if in marriage, let's go to husband and wife just for a little while. What if you made a deal? I was talking to Ruth about this earlier. We were sitting and chatting and my wife and I are about as different as any people in the world. They really are. Everything I like, she hates. And everything I like, she hates. It's just about that bad. You know, I love motorcycles. She hates them. I love camping. She did, I love travel. She doesn't like that, you know. All this kind of stuff, you know. How in the world are we going to make it? And, and, the idea, and somebody said to me, you're gone a whole lot. Why do you think we don't argue a lot? But we agreed a long time ago to give each other healthy doses of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. We try to make each other over in our own image. Husbands do that to their wives. Wives do that to their husbands. Get off his back. Give each one love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And by the way, parents, then give it to your kids. How you like that? How would you like to have healthy doses from your parents? A, a written commitment or a verbal commitment. Listen. We've had a lot of struggles, and I don't understand where you're coming from, and you don't, and I make rules, and you fight against them, and we have all of this problem. Let's make a deal here. I'm going to give you healthy doses of all the love I can give you, and all of the acceptance of who you are, and all of the forgiveness for all of your mistakes, and you've got to give it to your parents. You like the deal? I think you would, because I know I would. That's all I really want in the brotherhood, in the, in the church of Jesus Christ. But love me. And please accept me. I don't do everything right. People write me a lot, you know, and they criticize what I do. Well, come on, I'm human and I know more. I wrote to one guy and I said, all these little criticisms you got of me, you wouldn't even bother with them if you knew the big things I'm worried with. You know? One guy was beating me up, just beating me up. He was in my face and I said, okay, I'll take all of that. Now, just to get it in proper perspective, would you tell me something you think I do good? It bothered him. Because most people don't want to do that. But, you know, we, we do. And so you want to give your kids these. Now, so, number one, let's praise them, okay? Number two, let us thank God for our children. I even thought about doing this tonight, Jody, and I'm not going to. And I probably will regret that I don't. But in one place, I think it was only a couple of places that I've ever done this. But, but uh, I just decided, because I love groups of people. I, love, I don't like the Church of Christ circle. All the way around. Let's get real close together. Hold hands and make a circle where you'd have to have a bullhorn for somebody to hear you way back there. I don't want there to be any air between us. Get in here, you know, and all get together, see? And then let's love and pray with one another. And one night I asked all the teenagers, 13 through 19, come forward. We got over here in a space and get away from everybody. Come up here and just get all the air out. Get you know, no circle. Come on in here and just stand close together so there's people all around you. You know, and then I asked all their parents to come join them, lay hands on them. And did anybody else in the church that wanted to come lay hands on them and just thank God for these young people? We really have a lot of reason to thank God for you. I mean, you're creating the image of God, and the Bible talks about so many things. Uh, when Esau met Jacob, and, and all of his wives and children were out there in front of him, and, and Esau says an exclamation, Who are all these kids? And Jacob says back, these are the children that God has graciously given me. I mean, he was excited about God has graciously given Don't you, you thought that when they were born. Don't ever forget what a gracious gift your children are to you. In Psalm 113, in verse 9, it says that God has made her a happy mother of children. And somebody said to me, when should I start being thankful for, for my children? When are you going to get pregnant? That's the time to start. We just need to start from the very beginning in being thankful for our kids. Number three, let's love our children. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and verse 29, no, no man ever hates his own flesh, but he nurtures it and cherishes it, you know, as Christ did the church. And the Bible says for older women, Titus 2 and verse 4 in the church, this is your job. This is what we do. These are the cultures we pass along. And these are not national cultures. These are biblical cultures. That's a lot stronger. Older women teach the younger women to love their husbands and love their children and to be discreet and chaste and pure uh, keepers of the home. You say, well, I love them. Uh, and then we go to this thing about, uh, have you told them? You know, uh, I mentioned that a little bit last night. Uh, this guy saying, I told you I loved you, and if I ever change my mind, I'll... 
let you know. But we need to say the words. We say often, well, it goes without saying. That's the problem. Get it out. Get it said. Well, it's a little difficult for me. Well, then spit it out difficult, you know. People used to think preachers will win soul. One little lady said to me, I'd be a soul winner if I could do like you preachers. You say to a guy, here's the Scriptures, one, two, three, follow me to the baptistry. If I could do it that easy, I'd win souls for Christ. And I said, let me tell you how I do it after 50 years of soul winning. I get down to the point, I love sharing Christ, boy. I just love that. And I get down to the point of asking them to respond to Jesus. And guess what? My mouth gets a little dry. And my tongue gets a little thick. And I begin just a little bit of sweat under the arms or across the forehead. See, Jesus didn't say you had to ask them. Cool. Just ask them. And so I, would you like to respond to Jesus right now? You know? And they go do it. See? And so here's your kids, and you love them. If I ask any parent, it would be insane for any parent to stand up and say, I'll tell you what, I don't love my kids. Come on. That's some kind of monster that would do a thing like that. You love them. When's the last time you told them? Well, and more than tell them, uh, show them and give them plenty of affection. It's been my uh, experience to see little boys who've been taught some way that they don't need affection. So some, some their mother, their aunt, somebody comes along, gives them a hug, and they yeah, go ahead and move around. But I tell you what, you watch them close, and all the time they're, re- they're rejecting all of this. They're smiling. They're laughing. Because the worst thing you can do to your child is not give them the affection that they need. We're afraid it's going to make them sissy and soft and homosexual. Let me tell you what causes all the quirks and perversion in the world and homosexuality and and a whole bunch of other things is more caused by withheld affection than too much affection. Number four, I'm passing these fast because I'm... Because I'm... It's back there, but I'm not going to say it. Number four, listen to your children. I'm going to tell you a story. There was a, there was a guy that was a, the field representative of his company. A lot of you can relate to that because you are men and women. And you travel a lot. And this guy I heard about was uh, uh, traveling a whole lot. So he'd finished the day, long day. And in, in his motel room that night, he'd had a late dinner back in the lonely motel room, finishing up all the paperwork and trying to get everything. And then, and then thoughts began to run toward home. And he realized, looking at his watch, man, it's 11 o'clock and I haven't called home. And so he dialed the number quickly. And at 11 o'clock, his four-year-old boy answered the phone. And he said, Johnny, what are you doing up this late? Let me, let me talk to your mama. And little Johnny said, Daddy, mama's asleep. And he said, well, no, no, well, go wake her up because Daddy wants to talk to her. And he said, Daddy, she's been asleep all day, and I've been trying to wake her up, and her eyes are open, and they look funny. And Daddy says to the little boy, Johnny, hang up quick so I can get help. And his little son screamed back in the phone, Daddy, don't hang up on me. You can see the scene of a little boy that had been there all day long, not knowing what's going on. It's an agonizing thing. But I've got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, There are young people all over the world that feel hung up on. That don't feel anybody cares. Why do you think we have suicide notes when they don't mean it? And why do we have so many accidental suicides when all they're trying to do is say, Don't hang up on me. We've got to listen to them. We've got to love them. We've got to listen to them. I found out early in life with my kids, you know, I was watching all the neglect and stuff, and I thought early in life when my kids are that small, I'm going to be different. You've you been there. I'm going to make time for my kids. I say to my kids, every Monday night, buddy, is family night. It's going to be you and me and the kids, and we're going to play together and do this and do that. And I didn't know that you can't get away with that. So I said, okay, Monday night, family night, and it's going to be good. We're all going to have a great time. Dad, they said, we're not going to have a great time. Because, see, i got a tennis lesson with so-and-so. i got to run track. I promised Mary I'd come study with her, you know. And here I am trying to be a good dad, and I've made my time, and after all, my work is so important, and now my kid's got no time for me. You know what you have to do? You have to stay available for them. You've already found out you can't make appointments with your kids. But they're going to need you. And they're going to need you when you're not ready to be needed. I mean, I tell my, my little ones, Tammy. Hey, we had two boys and this lovely little brown-eyed blonde girl comes along, you know. And I say, Tammy, it's 10 o'clock, time to go to bed. And she will say, she rolls those big brown eyes. Dad, can we talk? She's working me. 
And she knows that I know that she knows she's working me. Well, I'll tell you what, you better put that paper down. I mean lost, you know, and all those things as the stomach turns and all those programs you're watching. Age of hysteria, all of that stuff, you know. All of God's monsters, all of them, whatever. All of my monsters, whatever, you know. You're watching a lot. Put that paper down. Shut off that television, you know, because you're not going to have this time all of your life. And so some of the best talks we've had have been these times when I know that we were being worked, but they were some of the best. They were the best things in the world. I, I told you a little bit last night about when I quit making rules for my kids. I've got to tell you one time, parents, because this is, this is old, okay? You've got to adapt this to now. I don't know. I don't even know what you do now about hairstyles and stuff. I live in a different age. Raise kids in a different age. They change every day. So I decided coming back from Australia, okay, I'm going to try to be a good dad. I'm not going to try to make my kids look funny. But, buddy, you are. I'm going to tell you this. I'm giving up all the rules. But you're going to get a haircut once a month. And uh, she would get closer and closer to it, and I'm getting happier. Ha, ha, ha. Birthday. And you see, haircut, five days, four days. Ha, ha, ha. And I'm enjoying this, see. And the kids are getting more and more miserable. And we're not, it's not, we're, something's not working. And finally, when, when Mark said to me, Dad, uh, I've got to get a haircut in two days. And I said, yeah, that's right. He said, Dad, can I please have three days? That's a strange request. And I said, because I don't understand this. There's something I'm not getting here. So I said, Mark, why? How long can hair grow in three days? Why do you need three days? He said, Dad, because we're having our school pictures made, and I don't want to look bad. I thought I was giving him a haircut to make him look good. And before all of his kids at school, uh, you had to get a haircut. Hey, look at all of that, you know. And I said to him, oh, man, listen, we can't have that. And that's when I made that rule I was talking about last night. Get your kids together and make sure you've got to train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's your job, but you must train them up right. But when they get to this point I talked about last night, when they say, listen, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, and I'm going to serve Jesus all my life, and I've made up my mind to go to heaven, you are there. Your job from the day that child was born was to work yourself out of a job, to quit making laws. That's what you're there for, so that you can make them and make them and make fewer and make fewer and modify until those kids are out there standing on their own feet. That's our job. So when we get them to the point, when can we turn loose? It's when we know that we've done our job properly. And listening to them is a two-way street. You've got to listen to them. They've got to listen to, uh, to you. They've got to listen to God. And listening ought to be linked with prayer. I, I had something I was going to say here, and I... Oh, yeah, the, the system. Where's that system? Uh, you need to teach your kids the way you make decisions. Here's something that's not acceptable. Dad, can I do this? No. Why not? Because I said so. You ever heard that before? No, that's new to all of you, isn't it? I'm your mama and I say so. Well, that says to them, duh. You know, and you're thinking, duh, I'm the authority and that should solve it with us, you know. And you need to always tell them. So I made a three-point agreement with my kids that they now use with their kids. Here is the process for making decisions. Now, the Bible does say children obey your parents. If really, serious, I'm not joking. If God thought it was best, he would have said, parents, obey your children. And I said, <laughs> I got some agreement over here. And I really believe some think that sincerely. But you've got to trust God there and say, no, wait a minute, God said it, so it must be the right way. And in time, you will learn it is the right way. So if, if they've got to obey me, I've got to be a good parent. And that's a huge responsibility. So I taught them the system. Number one, when you come to me with anything, number one is I listen. Number two, we pray. And number three, I decide. Now, before you think that's too gruff to the young people in here, that's a pretty good system because here's the way. It's never, you know, it's never over. I let, give me your best case. I'm a parent. I've not done this before. You, you know, I used to say to my 15-year-old, you're the first 15-year-old ever raised. Come on, lighten up on me. I'm doing the best that I can. You know, and so, and so I listen. Is that all? Yes, I want to do this for these reasons. Okay. Uh, you got anything else? Is that it? Well, that's it. Okay, I have listened. Now, can we both pray? And both of you pray. 
Oh, God, help me to be a good child to understand, to grow to maturity. Oh, God, help me to be a good parent and not uh, exasperate them. Help me to be lenient and patient and understand. And you ask God about all of this. And then when it's, you've listened and you have prayed to God, then it is time for somebody to make the decision. And God says, parent, it's your turn. And you've got to say, I've decided for you not to do that. Or I've decided it's okay for you to do it. Well, Dad, I don't agree. Okay, when you get some more evidence, come back. We'll do the system over again. That makes sense? I listen any time. I don't say, no, we did that. I Dad, I got some more evidence. Well, in our courts, when you got more evidence, you go back to trial. So they can come back and state it again, and we will pray again together, and we will hug and hold and affirm our love, and then I've got to decide again. And it's got to happen until you get to point, until you can make the decision for your kids. So listen to your children. Number five, believe in your children. Never, ever accuse your children of lying. You hearing me? Never. You're lying to me. That's the worst thing in the world. Child is already a little bit uppy, and you say to them, you're telling me, you're a liar, you're telling me, and you know it. You're lying, and you know it. You know what they say inside them? Okay, okay, he doesn't believe me anyway, so it is justified for me to lie all I want to. And you'll raise a liar that way. Now, let me ask you a question. Will your children lie? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> so what do you do about it? Well, let me give you an example. Mark, I was a pretty strict parent. I, I'm happy about this. I tried to be fair, but I was what they would call strict. When I say something, I mean it. If I say 11 o'clock is your curfew, I do not mean 11.05. I'm telling you the truth. You need a good story if you come in at 11.05 if I've said 11. Or 12 or 1 if you come in 5. Then my kids all knew this. Now, they're going to fight with you wherever you set the boundary, so you may as well set it where you want it. So one night, one night with these rules, my son Mark was 30 minutes late. I mean, I'm up waiting, you know. He is in trouble. And I'm in trouble. Here comes the cops right here. Did you ever see a first century policeman with a, with a camera? Anyway, all right. All right, somebody get him. I'm telling you, that is a jazzy looking skirt. I've got to tell you that. That is something else. Anyway, so he comes in 30 minutes late. I'm standing at the door. He walks in the door and he says, Dad, i got a good story. I said, you need one. He said, okay, Dad. He said, I was coming home. You know, I was on my way home. And he said, I ran through this water and the car died. And, and man, I, I rushed around there to get the car started and I'm home. I said, is that it? He said, yeah, Dad, that's it. And I said, okay. You know that I mean what I say and you know that we were worried. I'm thankful that you're home. God bless you. Okay. And I started in my bedroom. And Mark started up the stairs. I mean, it sounded fishy as all get out. But he was scot-free. And as he got the third step, he looked back and said, Dad, can we talk? I said, yeah, we can. And he walked back down the stairs and said, Dad, that isn't the way it happened at all. I said, what happened? He said, Dad, I just really wasn't paying any attention. And I looked at my watch and I thought, good night, I am 30 minutes, I'm dead. My dad is going to skin the hide off of me with his eight-foot belt with hooks in it. And he said, you know, and I'm thinking on the way home, I need a story, I need a story. He said, I saw that water. So I ran in it and turned the key off. He said, the motor died. Duh. He said, then I started and came on home. And I'm, I'm fighting not to laugh, you know. But the bigger story is, I said to him, Mark, can I ask you a question? You were scot-free. You were upstairs, free, end of story. Why did you come back and tell me? You know exactly what he said. Dad, you believed me. Kenny Rogers sang that song that she believes in me. I'm proud of you. And I'd say, okay. See, you don't ever say to your kids, you're lying to me. But you can say, okay. Are you telling me the truth? Yes, I am. Okay, because you know. State this. You know in our family we do not lie. We don't lie here. So thank you for telling me the truth. And I'm trying to tell you that the worst punishment you can give a child is to believe in them if they're lying to you. And it will cause more repentance and more getting back close to one another. All right. Uh, I've got to tell you one more here. I'm full of these stories, you know, tonight. And you've got to understand that I am. Uh, 
I asked my daughter when she was like 14, 15. I always like to check up on myself. So I said to Tammy one night, Tammy, what do you think I would do if you got pregnant? And she said, oh, Dad, that'd be awful. And I said, yeah, it would be. But, but I'm, what I said was, uh, what do you think I would do? She said, oh, Dad. She said, I'm the preacher's daughter in the church. And oh, and, oh it would just be horrible. And I said, Tammy, yes, all of that's true. But my question is, what do you think I would do if you got pregnant at 15 out of marriage? I remember screwing up that little body and looking me straight in the eye with those big brown eyes. And she said, I believe you would stand right beside me. And I said, don't you ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. You can break my heart. You can disappoint me. You can do anything in the world. But you can never, ever make me leave your side. I'm going to be there as long as I am alive. And if, we, and if your kids know that, I really believe that they need more than all of our rules, which they do need because they're inexperienced and we've come along the road. And the Bible says it. But they need us to be with them. They need to know that you will never forsake them. Kids and divorces, the biggest problem they face is, am I going to be left alone? Am I going to be uh, forsaken? So... Believe in your children. i got two more, and I'm going to do this quickly. Number, number six is discipline your children. you got to discipline your children. I've got to withhold what I really want to say tonight because I don't think I'm on the same page with modern-day parents. I'm real sorry about that, and I will accept the possibility that I'm getting older and don't understand you. But at the same time, I don't buy you believing that you can't make your children mine. Well, what can you do with an 18-year-old? Let me give you a <clears throat> biblical example. In 1 Samuel 1 and verse 11, Hannah begged God for a son, saying, God, if you will give me a son, I will give him to you all the days of his life. My oldest one <clears throat> now is 52 years old, and I have given him to the Lord all the days of his life. I can't legally or otherwise make him do anything, but I've given him to God and I will zap him all the way to the doors of hell with love and prayers and people because Satan is not getting my child. So help me, God. And I believe that you can do that. And you say to your wayward children, I love you. I will never forsake you. I've given you to God and my law is going to stand until you stand before him. State it clearly. There's, there's where I said about I listen, we pray, etc. See, the Bible says in the latter days when perilous times come, here are the bad things that are going to happen in the world, and you're going to know we're in the last days when this happens. Children will be disobedient to their parents. In God's eyes, that's a horrible sin. I've thought about you reading the Old Testament verbiage because when you couldn't do anything with a disobedient child, they were instructed to take them out and stone them to death in front of the camp. Are you far that, Marvin? Not on your life. But it shows you how serious the God of heaven takes this business of discipline. You see, parents, you're shaping their view of authority. And if we don't get our view of authority correctly in school and government and in home and parenting and in the church, and we're finally going to stand before God's authority, and it's going to be a, a bad time to say to God, Hey, I just did as I pleased. Because Jesus said, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of the Father which is in heaven. Parents, develop your children's attitude toward authority. Now, uh, seventh and last is this. Set them an example worth following. I remember when I was in Port Lavaca, Texas, <clears throat> I was real close to the chief of police and worked a lot with the police. <laughs> And we picked up a kid one night, drunk and wreck, and I can't remember now whether it was anybody just hurt bad or killed, but it was one of those. And uh, they called the father. Finally found him. They weren't at home. Found mom and dad drinking in some bar. <clears throat> we have your son in jail. He's had a wreck, drinking. And the dad said, I'll, I'll beat him within an inch of his life. He knows better than that. And when he talked to the boy in jail, the boy said to him, Dad, guess where I got my whiskey? Out of your liquor cabinet. I've been watching you and Mom drink and go to the bars all this time, and we've been sneaking it at home and doing it forever. And don't you can talk to me about anything, but don't talk to me about you telling me the way I ought to live. <clears throat> Are your parents safe 
following your example. Let me give you this poem, and then I really got the last point out of line. I've already given it to you. Give it once more. <clears throat> One of my favorites, and if I can't remember it, I've got it written down here, but I like to give it if I can. A careful man I want to be. A little fellow follows me. I do not dare to go astray for fear he'll go the self same way. I cannot once escape his eyes. Whatever he sees me do, he tries. Like me, he says, he's going to be this little chap who follows me. He thinks that I'm good and fine, believes in every word of mine. The base in me he must not see, this little chap who follows me. I must remember as I go through summer sun and winter snow, I'm building for the years to be that little chap who follows me. Really, the last thing I wanted to do, and we'll do it now, is give your children to the Lord. I'd like to suggest that we do it all over again. Uh, the only way I'm going to suggest we do it, First Samuel 1, just read the chapter. Do what Hannah did. I've given him to you all the days of his life. Maybe some of you parents have not really made that decision, and you can make it tonight. And only you and God will know that because we're just going to pray about it. And, and I can say to all the young people, with all the mistakes that your parents make, on top of all the mistakes that you make, why don't we realize that God knows what He's doing, and tonight you will recommit to being obedient to your parents, knowing they are human and often wrong, and commit to God. Church on the earth, and we'll all get to heaven together. Let's learn to really praise our young people into greatness. And let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, when we talk about parenting, we realize, boy, oh boy, are we really talking about a lot of mistakes, a lot of junk. We do a lot of things when we're tired and just don't want to be bothered. We even discipline. And uh, we do it out of anger and fear and all the wrong things. So we've, we come confessing bunches of sins. There probably ought to, even tonight at home, ought to be a lot of repentance, a lot of hugging, a lot of crying, a lot of praying among t uh, children and their moms and dads, whether it's a single parent family or both of them are there, whatever. We just need to do a lot of confessing. We've got to reassure each other that we love each other, proud of each other, pray for each other, give each other large doses of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. But what we really want to do, Father, I guess I'm rehashing this sermon in the, in the prayer. But what we really want to do is all of us, and I pray that we all will, you alone know this, that every person in this audience, because we're all a part of a family, will recommit ourselves to you. We will give ourselves unto God all the days of our lives. And that all of us parents will re-give all of our children to the Lord. And then back that with the best we can give from ourselves and promise the best prayer we can beseech you. We thank you, Father, for our children and pray that we may be good examples so that they are closer to heaven because of us. In the name of Jesus, amen.